To get our forum rolling, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Victoria Rideout, the author of Learning at Home, which each of you have at your places. Vicky's well known to most of you as a leading expert on children's health, media use, and policy. But even more central to her remarkable track record, in my view, has been her devotion to developing new forms of evidence in areas often neglected in the public discourse. Her work is driven by the highest standards of excellence, be it her national survey, <coughs> studies, public engagement work, or tireless advocacy for children and families. Vicki will share the new survey report and reflect on some possible implications. Her remarks will lead off a highly interactive forum, which will be led by Amy Jordan of the University of Pennsylvania's Edinburgh School of Communications, and Lisa Guernsey, who leads New America's Early Education Initiative. They and our discussion provocateurs have been a delight to work with, and I must thank them all in advance for the brilliant work that will be with us today. But now, Vicki, we're all eager to hear about how parents describe learning with media at home. Please recognize Vicki right now. Good morning. Thank you, Michael, and um, thank you all for being here. Um, as a Californian, I'm just totally impressed that you were in this weather and leave your homes at all. Um, this is a really exciting study for me to share with you. I, um, I believe that this is the first time that anybody has tried to measure on a national level what proportion of children's screen time is devoted to educational content. And so that was one of the purposes of this study. We wanted to look at that uh, at that proportion by platform by platform. So, what is it for television? What is it for um, computers? What is it for mobile media? And then also by um, other demographic factors, so age and gender and socioeconomic status. Another purpose for the study was to look in detail at which platforms parents think their kids are learning the most from, and which subjects they're learning the most about. We also wanted to measure joint media engagement, that is, how much time parents and kids are engaging with media together, and again, look at that across platforms, and also to document patterns of reading and e-reading. So those are the purposes of the study. We had a robust sample. Uh, we had more than 1,500 parents, including about 300 uh, black and 600, more than 600 Latino parents, nearly 700. They all reported on the media use habits of a focal child in the 2 to 10 year old age range. We used an online probability based sample, which is called the knowledge sample, fielded by JFK Research Company. I mentioned that this is the first study that I know of to actually try to document the portion of children's screen time that is educational or devoted to educational content. Of course, there's a lot of room for differences of opinion as to exactly what media products are educational and which aren't. And I can imagine we would have a robust debate in this room about certain titles. Um, so even among experts, there's a lot of room for disagreement and debate and discussion. Um, in this study, the method we used was to get parents' assessments of what they felt, their judgments of what they felt was, uh, which of their children's screen time was educational and which was not. Um, and as well, we rely on parents to tell us how much they think their child has learned. So this is not a study that has an objective measure. Uh, we don't have a series of criteria and coding all of the content and so on. We gave parents a definition of educational content, which you can see up here on the screen. It is obviously a broad and roomy definition. We did that on purpose. It's the definition that the Kumi Center believes is an accurate one. It is also one that um, is, a, is a generous definition. Um, so um, that's just something to keep in mind as we evaluate what we think of, you know, what we can learn from these data. Um, parents may very well overestimate or underestimate uh, how much of their children's screen time is educational. But I thought I would give you a sense for how parents assess the educational content of a couple of familiar topics, I mean, familiar properties, so that you have a feeling for what they do and don't consider educational. So this slide indicates the percent of parents who say each TV show is very educational. So you can see a majority, <coughs> nearly six in 10, say Sesame Street is very educational, but it's, <laughs> Not everybody, so this is not a bunch of pushover parents here. I mean, they're, they're being judgmental and they're, you know, 
So uh, it's about a third for Dora, um, a fourth for Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, and 2% for SpongeBob. So maybe you want to take the findings with at least 2% grains of salt. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is just to give you a sense as you evaluate the findings of, you know, this is what parents, where parents are coming from. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I think there is a lot of really good news for the educational media community in these findings. Starting with the fact that a large proportion of two to 10 year olds are regular, frequent users of educational media. You guys are reaching a large audience on an ongoing basis. It's a total of 80% of kids who are at least weekly users of some kind of educational media and a third who are doing it every day. So I think that's really good news. A large audience on a consistent basis. Another good piece of news is that parents tell us that their children are, in fact, learning from educational media. Among parents whose kids are weekly users, these are the percent who say their child has learned about each subject. And this is only the percent who say their child has learned a lot. So we're not including the sums here. And I think these are pretty encouraging results. Um, as you can see, according to the parents, uh, kids are most likely to be gaining knowledge about cognitive skills from educational media, and then reading and vocabulary and math with some other subjects falling a little further behind. One thing we thought was interesting was this here with science kind of falling so much lower than some of the other subjects. Um, and that may be something some of you here may have some insights about, and hopefully in the discussion we can maybe return to that and, and see what might be behind that. But altogether, it's a majority who say their child has learned a lot from educational media. So again, a really good piece of news. Another piece of good news, in my view, is that many parents report that their children are extending their learning from media off into the real world through actions and so on. So their kids are asking to do a project based on something they saw in educational media. They're asking their parent questions. Um, they're engaging in imaginative play based on educational media. Sometimes even teaching the parent something the parent didn't know themselves based on what the child has learned in educational media. And again, it's a majority who, have, who do that often. Again, we're not including the sometimes here. So I think really a lot of good news um, in this survey for this community. Now for some of the more challenging news. Um, the first item, and it's not a big surprise, I know, to anybody in this room, but there's some good documentation here for it, is that the proportion of children's screen time that's devoted to educational content drops way off once kids get out of that two to four year old age range. I know we knew it happens by the time they get in the eight to 10 year old age range, but I, this research is showing it happening even in the five to seven year old age range, and it's a pretty big drop off. Um, what's most concerning to me personally about this drop off in educational media is that it occurs at the same time that screen use overall is going up. So you have this dual, this combination of screen media use goes up from about an hour and a half to two and a half hours a day. The proportion that's educational drops way off from you know, more than three quarters of screen time among the young group down to about one quarter of screen time among the older group. And so then that result is an actual decrease in the amount of time that's spent with educational media. Now you can also say, look, even among the 8 to 10-year-olds are spending 42 minutes a day with educational media, which I do think is, you know, a, a positive finding. But um, it's, it's kind of that combination there that I think is a, is a challenge for us. And don't forget, we have that nice, broad, roomy definition of educational media. And maybe some of you were thinking, I bet parents are overestimating how much time their kids are spending with educational media because they want to convince themselves that you know, their kids are in good shape and they're being good parents. If that's the case, then we have even more reason to be concerned about the low proportion of screen time that's educational for the older kids. Another finding that stood out as a bit of a challenge to me was that mobile still is lagging pretty far behind TV in terms of how much kids are using it for educational purposes and how much they're learning from it. So first of all, a smaller proportion of the time that kids spend with mobile is devoted to content that their parents consider educational. Again, parents may or may not have an accurate assessment of that, and that's something that I hope maybe we can talk about. 
I think there's reasons to believe they may have a better judgment about TV content than mobile because they can see it more easily. You know, they're, they're watching what their kids are watching. Maybe because their kids are using mobile in smaller bursts, um, their parents aren't, aren't fully grasping how educational it is. But I do think it's an issue that, you know, parents say that more than half of the TV their kids watch is educational, but only about a third of the mobile. So what that ends up meaning is that children spend much less time with educational content on mobile devices than they do on educational TV, much less. So it's an average of 42 minutes a day with educational television and five minutes a day with educational content on mobile devices. So the potential of mobile is not being tapped yet. Um, I mean, we've been at it a lot longer with television, you know, so I mean, that can be part of it, but it, we're not there yet. Another way that we're seeing mobile lag behind is that even parents whose kids are using educational content on mobile devices on a regular basis, that is at least weekly, are telling us their, their kids are learning less from mobile than from television. So parents, rightly or wrongly, are less likely to attribute learning to the educational content their kids are doing on mobile devices than television. So these are the percent who say their child has learned a lot about at least you know, one of those subjects that we ask them about from the educational activities on these platforms. Um, you, you probably remember this slide here where we showed, this is the slide I showed you just a minute ago, of what percent of kids have learned a lot about any one of these subjects from any of the platforms that they use. Well, for I, each one of these subject areas, parents were most likely to say their child had learned from television than from any other platform, except for math. That they said they were most likely to learn from the computer. And for each one of these subjects, they were least likely to say their child had learned from mobile even behind educational video games. So that's where I'm seeing some red flags here to say, I don't think mobile is fully tapping its potential or else parents aren't understanding the impact that it's having. And again, that's just among the parents whose kids are using educational content on mobile. Okay, another finding that seems to me to be a bit of a challenge for our community concerns how parents find the educational media that their kids use. You can see in this chart the different ways um, that parents said they are finding educational media. And I guess what left out to me when I looked at this was that it just doesn't feel like that intentional of a process, you know? Um, and that might be a function of these, these were the options that we gave parents, but as I look at this, I say, gosh, I wish it was more than 20% who were checking for reviews and ratings, um, whether in papers or online or other resources. We want it to be a little more intentional and mindful than that. So again, that might be another topic for us to talk about in the discussion. Another interesting aspect of the founding findings, and in this case, I'm not really sure whether we've got positive, negative, or something in between, um, has to do with socioeconomic status. So I think a really important issue for the educational media community, at least certainly the nonprofit wing of the educational media community, is that there are still a lot of lower income kids who do not have access to many of the platforms that on which we deliver educational content to them. And as you can see here, there's a, there is one universal platform, and that is broadcast television. But even when you get to cable, for the lower income kids, I mean, it's like a 60-40 split. Um, a lot of them don't even have cable. And that's certainly the case also with high-speed internet and smartphones. And when you get to tablets, which is you know such a delightful platform for creating educational content, we're missing three quarters of the lowest income kids. On the other hand, we also found that low income kids use more educational media, at least according to their parents, than higher income kids. They're more frequent users of it. So this chart shows you for the, the percent who are daily users of some type of educational media, it's a quarter of the, high, of the kids from higher income families, but it's 43% of the kids from lower income families. It's mostly TV, but maybe this means we're reaching the target audience, the kids who need more uh, educational opportunities and stimulus in the home in a better way. 
Um, I think part of what's going on there is just that the lower income kids spend more time with screen media. So um, it's about an hour a day more than kids in upper income families. So of course more of it is educational. In addition, lower income parents are more likely than higher income parents to label the same content as educational. Okay, so if you ask them that question, you know, how educational is Sesame Street, how educational is Dora the Explorer, Mickey Mouse, et cetera, you'll get higher ratings of educational from the lower income parents than from the upper income parents. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, I'm not really sure what the findings are from the study. I mean, it may be that we're doing a good job of reaching the kids most in need, but it may be that they're just spending more time with screen media or that their parents have a different view of the educational value of media. Next, there were a couple of intriguing findings about uh, when we looked at the data by race and ethnicity. When we asked parents how much their children have learned from the educational media that they use, there was a pretty interesting split. And across almost every subject area, and every platform, the black parents were the most likely and the Hispanic parents were the least likely to say that their child had learned from media. The detailed table is in the report because we have this matrix of like 70 topics and four platforms, so you can see that all in there. But I put up one example for you here, and this is um, the percent who say their child has learned a lot or some about math from their educational activities on the computer. And it's a pretty pronounced difference here. Um, and this is sort of the, the type of difference that we saw reflected in all of the data. Now, at the same time, the Hispanic parents and Latin, Hispanic Latino parents were way more likely than other parents to say that they were looking for more information on how to find good quality educational media for their kids. So to me, there's some kind of red flag here that perhaps the educational media community is not doing as good a job as we would like to in reaching the increasingly diverse Hispanic Latino community and maybe getting information to them about what products are available. Okay, my last two topics. Joint media engagement and e-reading. There has been uh, a fair amount of research indicating that having parents and kids use media together in an active and engaged way enhances the benefit of educational media for kids. And so we wanted to measure how much of that is actually happening. Um, so you can see the results up here. And again, television is the medium that is most likely to be used together by parents and kids. And, um, mobile, video games, computers, less so. But still a fair amount of it going on. Maybe it's about a quarter of the time that kids are using mobile, video games, or computers that parent is using it with them. Finally, e-reading. We wanted to try to actually document how much time kids are spending reading on electronic devices versus in print. And these are the results among all two to 10 year olds here, um, that it's an average of about five minutes a day now per kid that occurs on e-reading and close to half an hour for print. Now, of course, part of this disparity has to do with not all kids have an e-reading platform in their home. It's about 62% total who do have some kind of uh, electronic platform at home, either a dedicated e-reader or a tablet device. <coughs> This pie chart here on the left of your screen shows you, if you look at the blue, it's about 38% of kids don't have any kind of e-reading platform at home, so they, they couldn't do it even if they wanted to. Um, the green at the bottom, close to a third who have an e-reading platform and the child uses it. Then there's this other interesting group that have an e-reading device, but they don't use it. And so we asked those parents why their child doesn't do it, that 32%, and that's what's on the right-hand side of the screen there. And you can see that some of the parents say, you know, the child's too young for e-reading. A lot of them are just saying they just prefer the experience of uh, print, and they don't want to have their child be spending more time with screens than necessary. So that concludes my presentation of the data. But before I sit down, I just want to offer a couple of concluding remarks. 
The purpose of this research is to help shine a light on something that I know we all consider really important, and that is the use of media as an informal educational platform in the home. And the point of today is for all of you who are the content creators, who are the educators, who are the media company executives, um, to have a few hours to be able to dig through these data um, and really see, is there something in here that can help inform the work that you do? Is there something in here that can help you do an even better job of what you do? We're not here to say that all media should be educational. 100% okay? was not the proportion we were looking to find. Um, there's obviously a big place for media that is just entertaining, that's about fun, that's about relaxation, that's about art. But this community, all of us, um, is here because we saw an opportunity, starting with Joan Gans Cooney some 44 years ago, to take advantage of this incredible platform as a way of entertaining and educating kids at the same time, and as a way of contributing to a goal that I know we all believe in our guts is one of the most important that our society faces, and that is helping to level and decrease the achievement gap among kids, contributing to equal educational opportunity, and enriching the lives of young children. So that is the part of the equation that we're going to focus on today. So how can we boost the proportion of screen time that is devoted to educational content among older children? Um, these are some of the questions that I think I'm hoping we can all talk about here today. And you know the format, as you can see, there's no panel up here. So um, every person here has so much to contribute that we want this to be a true discussion. So ask any questions you have, make any comments. Nobody's going to say to you, try to phrase that as a question. We, we want to hear your comments if you want to make a comment, if you have a thought. Um, these are my thoughts on what some of the important topics are for us to talk about. How do we boost educational media use among older children? How do we reach the low-income children who are most in need? Um, how can we do a better job of creating compelling mobile content? Um, how can we reach even more parents than we already are with the information and resources that are already even available to them about how to choose good quality educational media for kids? Are we creating content that's meeting the needs of the increasingly diverse Hispanic community? And are we doing the best that we can to encourage high quality educational content? So whatever else is on your minds as well will be the subject for conversation today. Um, I just want to say thank you for your work. Thank you for your attention, your presence here today. And I need to say a huge thank you to everybody at the Cooney Center who uh, worked so hard to bring this project together from Catherine, Sadak, Michelle, Lily, colleagues at Sesame, who were such great uh, help, including Jody, Jen, June, and of course, especially, I want to thank Michael and Lori for giving me the opportunity to work with you guys on this study. Um, it has really been a privilege and a fantastic opportunity. So thank you. That'll turn it back over.